Let's all stand and we will open our service in prayer tonight. And bow with me, please. Father in heaven, thank you once again for life. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for your bountiful grace, your daily provisions, your precious Son, and even the trials that you allow us to go through. Thank you for sustaining us. Thank you for growing us. And Father, I pray for tonight that you'd bless those that might be on their way and give us a great time around your word and around worship. Help us to lift up our voices to you. Meet the deepest needs of your people tonight. And thank you for those that are joining us online. Uh, Father, we pray that you would accomplish everything that you do as you build your church. Uh, feed your people tonight. And we just commit this service to you, pleading the blood of Jesus Christ. And we ask this in his precious name. Amen. Please remain standing. All right, let's turn to him 413. Take time to be holy. Him 413. <laughs> couple of announcements. Uh, the men's uh, conference this year will be on uh, November 10th and 11th at Chad's Ford Baptist Church. There's registration forms are on the back table. Uh, our next soup and chili fellowship and panel discussion will be on Sunday, October 29th. We already have topics to discuss, but still welcome more topics for, for future panel discussions. This time I'll have the ushers come forward and as we take our general offer. Let's bow up to the offering, please. Dear Lord, we just thank you for your provisions. Lord, thank you that uh, you've blessed this church for, for so long. We ask you to continue to bless it. Help us to be wise with the spending of the funds you provide, Lord. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you very much, Jane. Please take your Bibles and turn to Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. And let's all stand for the reading of God's Word. Our text tonight is Jeremiah chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 20 down through the end of the chapter to verse 31. Jeremiah 5, verses 21 through 31. Verses 20 through 31. Follow along, please. God declares, or God says, Declare this in the house of Jacob and publish it in Judah, saying, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not, Fear ye not me, saith the Lord? Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree, that it cannot pass, cannot pass it? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain, both the former and the latter, in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait, as he that setteth snares, they set a trap, they catch men. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they are become great and waxen rich. They are waxen fat, they shine, yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper, and the right of the needy do they not judge. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. And what will you do in the end thereof? May God bless his word. Please bow with me in prayer. Father, before us tonight is a very important text, of course, as all your word is. But we pray that uh, tonight, as we see what you were telling your people so long ago, in, in a different time, uh, at a crucial time, that, um, that needed these people to be alert to your message uh, because of what could have been and what ended up being ahead. So, Father, uh, we believe that we are standing at a crossroads in America, and I pray, Father, that you would allow us to glean the message that you had from them and, and help us to see what this means for us, that we can learn something, that, that the message that was to Judah so long ago in many ways is also to us right now, right here. And Lord, we ask you to bless us tonight. In Jesus' precious name, amen. And you may be seated. All right, let's take our hymnals once again. We'll turn to him 303, Glory to His Name, in 303. Am I on the wrong one? Huh? Am I on the wrong song? No, I think we are on the wrong one. <laughs> oh, well. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. I, can, I can switch. No, what no, that's doing? right. You're right. What are we no. doing? 303. I was looking at something else. Go ahead, Jane. No, no hang on. We are on the wrong one. <laughs> hang on a minute, Jane. Hang on. There's there's another song, Glory to His Name. It's uh, it's different, though. Yeah, it is. It is. Yes. I know that. Either way. Blessed be the name. Draw straws. <laughs> <laughs> 
We will find it. Where do we go? Blessed be the name. Yeah, yeah I believe that's it. But oh, I can. Just got to find it alphabetically here. Yeah, that's what I'm. Uh, it is number thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. I believe. Check first. <laughs> Maybe I misunderstood the assignment. <laughs> yep, that's it. That's it is. Here we go. One more time, Jane. We'll get this. Let's open our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 5 again, please. Jeremiah chapter 5. The theme has not changed. And the theme will not change through this entire book. Uh, it is apostasy. Uh, a key Hebrew word that is used in various contexts is the word turn. Uh, they turned from God to idols they are being challenged to turn back to God, to repent, and they will eventually be turned into captivity, Babylonian captivity, uh, down the road. So this, this word turn, return, um, and in fact down the road it will also talk about returning from Babylonian captivity. But tonight we are going to look at uh, this text here, Jeremiah 5, verses 20 through 31, and we see that God reserves the right to set the terms. He has entered a covenant relationship with his people. Uh, he has already laid out. In fact, keep your place here in Jeremiah 5. And I want you to turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Because this is where God establishes his covenant and articulates the blessings and the cursings of this relationship that they had entered. And uh, God reserves the right to be able to set the terms of this relationship. And we see, just look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all His commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come. And from, verse, from there all the way to verse 14, he just lays out the blessings. This is, these are the things I want to do. These, in our relationship, this covenant relationship. If you will walk with me, if you will follow me, here's the blessings. 
Then, look down at verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Verse 16. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. And, and so now he goes on and shares all the curses, and the curses go all the way down to the end of the chapter in verse 68. That's a lot of warning, is it not? That's a lot of uh, withholding the blessing. And remember, uh, when you, you know, a curse is when God withholds the blessing. I'll never forget September 11th when a, a, you know, a very well-known evangelical preacher uh, declared that September 11th was the judgment of God and people were so bent out of shape. How can you say that? They were so offended, which to me is a tragic response to a very clear statement. And I remember at the time thinking, you don't think it's a curse of God. You, you, it's obviously not the blessing of God. But see, the problem is we just remove God. You know, the world has, you know, in America has, by and large, removed God. And so it's, you know, God is not in all their thoughts. But to us, you know, those of us, especially that are in a covenant relationship with the Lord by faith through Jesus Christ, we, 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 we're in a relationship and we experience the blessings and the cursings that God has clearly established and it is His right to set the terms on our relationship with Him. And so basically in Deuteronomy 28, He is telling them, this is how our relationship is going to work. If you think it's wrong, for God to assume the responsibility of making the rules, you don't understand who God is. He is the creator of all. He is the sustainer of all. By Him all things consist. The New Testament says hold together. He is the source. I mean, He is our everything. So certainly, He is in a place where He can set the boundaries. He can set the terms of our relationship. And he can determine, this is, you know, I want to bless you, but if you walk away from me and you, you don't esteem my statements and the things that I care about, if you ignore them, you're going to be, you know, things aren't going to go well for you. And, you, you know, people will fault God for that, but he has every right to do that. So we're going to look at three things that show us that he has every right to set the terms. First of all, we see God's place. It is his place to be able to do what he's doing. And that's in verses 21 through 24. Actually, verse 20 through 24. Then we see God's parameters. God is the one that says this is right and this is wrong. He is the, the divine lawgiver. And so he has every right to say what right and wrong is. He created us. Uh, and so he articulates that. Uh, his parameters, verses 25 through 29. And then we see God's perplexity in the last two verses, verse 30 and 31, uh, where God I expresses his dismay at the response of his people, the Jews, Judah. He, he just marvels. So let's jump in. And uh, as we go through this verse by verse, notice in verse 20, his instruction, he says, Declare this in the house of Jacob and publish it in Judah. Saying So here's his instructions to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I want you to declare this. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, hey, Jeremiah, run this by the people and, and tell, me what they, tell, tell me what they think. He doesn't say. He says, declare this. He doesn't say, Jeremiah, I want you to, I want you to go and ask the people if this is acceptable. He doesn't say this. And... and he doesn't say it because he is in the place as the omnipotent God, as the creator, and as the one that entered into covenant with these people. It is his right to tell Jeremiah, I want you to declare this. You just lay it out. 
it'll be up to them to respond. They have the choice to respond or not, but you communicate this to them. And so right away, God is establishing his place. Look at verse 21. Hear now this, oh, and by the way, verse 21 and 22 is reminiscent of an approach that God took when he tried a man, the, the severest trial a man has ever gone through, except for Calvary, except for what Jesus Christ went through. When he responded to the man Job, after he severely tried Job, and allowed Job to, to go through a wilderness experience where he did not know what God was doing, he just, he just lamented chapter after chapter after chapter, he just wanted to communicate. He wanted to get a word. He wanted to have an audience with God. And so we hear his musings. We see and hear the response of his friends who came and, and, and thought they had some wisdom to offer to him. Uh, and then finally, God speaks. And what he says to Job, to put Job in the right frame of mind. You know, Job, ultimately, in a sense, he is rebuking Job. But the rebuke would more come on his friends. And when he did get to his friends, he would say, you, you men have not spoken the right thing about me like Job did. But when he answers Job, he is basically putting himself where he should be. And he knows that Job needs to hear what God says. And, and ex what... What God through Jeremiah tells Judah is very similar. So let's look at what God tells Jeremiah in verses 21 and 22. He establishes his right to rule his creation. And he goes back to his creative work. He created the world. He created the earth. And just like he did with Job, we'll look at that in a minute, he does the same thing here. First he talks about creating people, their eyes, their ears. It's a play on, look at verse 21. Hear now this, O foolish people. He's saying you are simple-minded and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. He just said, hear this. You know, and now he's saying you have ears and you can't hear. So, you, again, you have, ear, you have um, eyes. By the way, God's, it's like he's saying, I created your eyes, you can't see. I created your ears, you can't hear. Look at verse 22. Fear ye not me. Don't you fear me? Remember, the fear of the Lord is a good thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Uh, the fear of God is a good, wholesome, it's something that leads us to wisdom and he says, fear ye not me. You don't fear me. Why, why don't you fear me, saith the Lord? Will you not tremble at my presence, which have, now he's talking about himself, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass it, and the, though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. God is ex uh, explaining his mighty power. And by the way, the sea is a powerful thing, isn't it? I mean, when you, you see pictures, if you've ever been out by the, you know, on a, a ship, if you've seen videos of, of uh, even some of these cruise ships that go through the storms and all, there's some pretty dramatic, scary video where you realize the sea is just so powerful. And, you know, I think of these tsunamis, how the, the sea can just come up and just swallow up the land and its people. It is so powerful. And yet God is saying, I'm the one that created that. I'm the one that set the boundaries, the sand. And as fierce as it is, I contain it. I control it. I'm the one that sets the boundaries. He's basically saying, listen, I am the creator and you need to give me my due respect in my due place, which they were not doing. They were more impressed with the idols of the Canaanites that didn't exist. Moloch, Balaam, you know, Ashtaroth, all these, 
all these Canaanite gods that the Canaanites were so impressed with and, and worshipped. And Israel began to esteem them incredibly, incredibly offensive to the omnipotent creator of the world. And he, so he's, he's, he's just communicating that. Listen to this. In Genesis, don't need to turn to these two verses. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 9. I bring you back to the beginning. The six days of creation. And in verse 9, the Bible says very simply, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Wow, just like that. That's how powerful God is. God said, let there be light. There's light. He just spoke it. You and I cannot imagine that power. That, that just to speak. I think we saw a sense of that because the Bible tells us in the New Testament that you know the, the Trinity, that Jesus Christ is God, and he, the, the um, New Testament in Colossians, I believe it is, that by him were all things created. Jesus Christ was, you know, part of the Godhead created the world, and by him all things consist. And I think there's a glimpse of that when, you remember when the, the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, and he, he spoke the word, and they all fell back. And that's, that's nothing compared to speaking the world into existence. But let's put God in his rightful place. He is the omnipotent God. Now, let's go to Job, just in our minds. I'm going to read it to you. I mentioned what happened. Everything went wrong in Job's life. He lost everything. Un un unfavorable events, as we talked about this morning. And Job just wants an audience with God. He doesn't understand it. You know, in the best of his ability, he has feared God. He has walked with God. And, and it seemed like, Everything was going wrong. He lost his family, lost his business, lost his possessions. And then finally God answered. And in Job 38, verse 1, listen to what it says. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said. And this is what Job would need to hear. Now, by the way, I've mentioned this before. I forget the exact number. But throughout the, these, these chapters up to verse chapter 38, Job, you know, has all these questions for God. And now, God, now that God speaks, you might think, oh, good. Job's going to get his questions answered. No. God starts asking Job questions. And by these questions, he establishes and reminds Job of his place to set the terms. That's what he's doing. So listen to what he said. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is he that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Uh, that would be me, Job could say. Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. Let's remember, God is the judge of all the earth. You know, when you hear people sometimes just, you know, sincerely, brokenly maybe, but maybe misguidedly, talking about how they can't wait to stand before God, and they've got some questions for Him. It's okay to have questions for God. But be careful how you word it. Because Job had some questions for God, but God didn't answer them. But instead, God set things straight. He reminded Job of who was in charge. And, and here's what he said. Gird up now thy loins like a man, I will demand of thee, answer thou me. Verse 4. Where wast thou? Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. That's a, that's a, try and answer that, Job. Hey, Job, when I created the world, when I laid out this earth, uh, where were you? Uh, well, God, I haven't been created yet by you. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely a humbling it's, it's, what it's doing is it's reminding Job, you are the creation, I am the creator. I am, you are the, the pottery, I am the potter. You know, he's, he's just establishing that. 
Where was, and by the way, Job doesn't answer because God's not looking for an answer because it's self-evident. Where was thou when thou laid the, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof if thou knowest? You know, who's, who just set up everything that there is in this earth? The boundaries and so forth. Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? And, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? He goes on, verse 8. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb? Now this is very similar to what he was telling Jer uh, what Jeremiah was saying to the people of God, right? He's saying, you know, who created the oceans and put the sand, the boundaries in there? And, you know, despite how fierce it can be, I'm in control of it all the time. He's basically saying that to Job. And by the way, after Job, or after God speaks all these things, don't ever forget, God never answered one of his questions, and yet Job was completely satisfied because he needed to hear what he needed to hear. And sometimes that's what we need. We just need to be reminded, okay, God, you're in charge. I, I, I've been losing perspective. I've been getting a little annoyed with you, which is, is um, you know, totally inappropriate because you're the creator. You've revealed yourself as good. I don't know what you're doing, and I don't always need to know what you're doing to be able to trust you and be sure that you're not doing anything wrong. And, and that's what Job needed, and I think that's what Judah needed as well. Look at verse 20. Let's go back to Jeremiah 5 now. Jeremiah chapter 5. He goes on, but this, uh, verse 23, But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. Revolting, the idea of being stubborn and rebellious. They are revolted and gone. In other words, they, in fact, both of these terms, revolted, it's been like a revolution, and they are gone, is action on their part. They are the ones that turned away, revolted from God. They are the ones that are gone away. Now it's interesting. When a child of God walks away from God, in his or her perspective, he often thinks that God is the one that has removed himself from him. And yet, notice the, the terminology. You see, you, you and I can be sure that Judah was, all the Jews that were part of Judah, this nation, that every one of them were experiencing what someone would experience where they have departed from God. But in their mind, because they don't, they're not blaming themselves, they're, not, they're thinking that God's the one that's at fault here, that God has walked away from them. Every one of them were experiencing the same things, that, very similar things that we would experience as Christians if we stray from the Lord and lose that intimacy, but don't quite put our finger on it and assume, why, God, why are you so far from me? And, and obviously by what Jeremiah is saying, that's what they were experiencing. Verse 24. Neither say they in their heart. Let us now fear the Lord our God. That would have been the right response. You know what? We need, we need more of the fear of God. We need it. That's, when someone says, let us now fear the Lord, they're, they're saying, I need to get back with God. I need to get back into fellowship with God. I need to start... Back then, it would be, I need to start worshiping God, Yahweh. I need to start doing the things that, you know, I need to get away from these pagan gods and stop going to these high places and, you know, doing what the Canaanites do. And I need to worship Yahweh the way he wants to be worshiped. And today, it would be, I need to get back with the Lord. I need to start praying. I need to start reading my Bible. I need to start fellowshipping with God's people. I need to get, get involved in a church, those kind of things. They're all the same, and they're all things that when people get far from the Lord, it's very easy for them to think, God, where have you gone? And many have said that to God. And they don't say in their heart, let us now fear our God that giveth rain. And it goes back to this idea that, you know, his, his common grace, uh, that giveth rain both the former and the latter in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. In other words... 
God is still blessing them. He reigns on, on the just and the unjust. Remember how important rain was. You know, we, we just had a rain today, and, and none of us are like, oh, thank the Lord, my crops needed that. Oh, you know, we're like, oh, it's raining out there. Oh, it sure is nice out there. Or, boy, that rain is sure a pain. You know, I got to, whatever it is. But understand that when the rain was a life-giving sustenance to these people, and even though they were far from God, God is still blessing them and giving them their harvest and the rain, and they're not even acknowledging it. They're slighting God, and they're not even aware of it. They're not like, you know, we need to fear the Lord. We need to get back to God because look how, look how good He's been to us. He's been blessing our harvest and all. That wasn't where they were at. They're like, I haven't not done anything wrong. I don't know where God is, is the idea. By the way, that self-reliance is always a dangerous thing. You know what's interesting? We know now, I've told you and, and we've read that we know ahead, that we know who's going to enter the picture. Remember yet last week we looked at the, um, the command for a mysterious nation and force to go into the vineyard and start doing the pruning and all. Well, we will know down the road that that would be King Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. Well, it's interesting, you know, because he was not a God-fearing man. But you know what? God still humbles unsaved heathen people. And I want to read to you. You don't need to turn there. But um, in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar gets a little lesson from God. Because the Bible says this, and this is not exclusive to Christians. And it's an Old and New Testament principle. It's just a universal principle that God resists the proud and He gives grace to the humble. And that includes saved and unsaved, pagan and Christian. So listen to this. Daniel 4 and verse 29. At the end of 12 months, He, that's Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon... The king spake. So he's looking. And by the way, apparently Babylon, uh, the, the hanging gardens of Babylon were one of the ancient wonders of the world. It must have been a spectacular kingdom. Uh, I mean, just talk about the glory of man and just must have been very beautiful. So he's out as the king and he's walking around and he says, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. You, ever, you remember if any of you study uh, Isaiah 14, the five I wills of Satan, where Satan says, I will be like the Most High. I will exalt myself. You know, Satan had an eye problem, and so did Nebuchadnezzar. That is, exalting himself, pride. And God resists the proud. So, again, think of this arrogant statement the king said. Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Do you realize, folks, remember, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him, but also to resist the proud. And, and so... It wasn't like God's like, all right, I'm just going to deal with my people. The Jews, now Christians through Jesus Christ, I'm just going to deal with my people and let those other people go. When Nebuchadnezzar uttered that, he was giving no regard to God, and God heard it. In fact, look, look what it, or listen to what it says. Now, he just boasted. I read that twice already. This is my kingdom by my power and all. And then in verse 31 it says, While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from me. There had been a prophecy earlier by Daniel about his fall, and now he was exalting himself, and God says, that's it. I resist the proud. I am going to humble you. And then that whole story, if you, it's very interesting. You know, he went out in the field like an animal, and it just you know, he was very humbled. And for a time, at least, it seemed like he did acknowledge God, that you know, Yahweh, it seemed like he did. Uh, but it's interesting that so many times, in fact, listen to this. I had, I had 
read this in my studies for this text. And, um, a theologian made this statement about this whole idea. He said, The careless soul receives the Father's gifts as if it were a way things had of dropping into his hand. Yet he is ever complaining as if someone were accountable for the problems which meet him at every turn. For the good that comes to him, he gives no thanks. Who is there to thank? At the disappointments that befall him, he grumbles. There must be someone to blame. Now, I read that you know, earlier this week and, and wrote it down. I thought this was a good quote. And then I was looking over my notes before tonight, and I read that again, and I said, I just heard someone saying this. Who said that? And then I remembered this morning, just this morning, after our morning service, Reuben and I were talking in the back, and Reuben was talking about politicians, and he said, why is it that politicians, when, you know, when things are bad, then, then they say, oh, we need to pray, but when things are good, they, they take credit and say, that was because of my policy, you know, and, and uh, you know, he was very frustrated at that, and, and we see that. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's kind of human nature. And that's exactly what this quote is. You know, it, it's, it's the idea that, you know, when things are going well, we don't think to thank God. We're not thinking that, you know, it's, it's just our good fortune or I brought this upon myself. But when things go bad, then we're either looking for someone to blame and, you know, it's a whole different story. That was Israel. And that was the Jews. And that was Judah at this point that... Um, Again, uh, neither in verse 24, neither say they in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God that giveth rain, both the former and the latter in his season. He reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. I read one time that um, you've all heard of Andrew uh, Carnegie. He was a multimillionaire. And when he passed away in his will, he left a million dollars to one of his relatives. Say, hey, you know, I wouldn't mind, wouldn't mind being left in someone's will for a million dollars. Do you know that that relative cursed him vehemently after he got that? Cursed him vehemently for years. Why? Because he had left $365 million to public charities and had only given him a measly million dollars. How's that for ingratitude, you know? I mean, here's someone that he's given a million dollars, and instead of saying, wow, I'm a million dollars richer than I was, he's like, but that $365 million is mine. That should be mine. Think about God. You know, he blesses us abundantly. But then he blesses someone else, maybe a little more than us. Do we get like that? Certainly the Jews had become discontent or they never would have looked at Canaanites and their religion and their God small g and been enticed by that. They should have looked at that and thought, we have got you beat hands down. We serve the living and true God. The God that created us and the God that created you. We serve the omnipotent God. The, the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, they had... They worshipped Yahweh and they did not appreciate it. They did not value it. And therefore, they fell. So let's look at God's parameters. Look at verse 25. Now God sets the parameters and as God, He is saying, listen, I have the right to determine what's right and wrong. And in verse 25, He says, Your iniquities have turned away these things from... Uh, uh, these." Your iniquities have turned away these things, the blessings. And your sins have withholden good things from you. This is very important. Remember, they were blaming God. You know, we've not done any wrong. And when Jeremiah came along, you might remember, they were saying, this isn't going to happen to us. These, what are you talking about? These judgments and all this. Our God, we're in a covenant relationship. God would never do that to us. And they're, they're looking at and they're, what's going to happen, you know, is they're going to be blaming God. Your iniquities have turned away these things. Their behavior in this relationship is what causes their problems. And their sins have withholden good things from you. Read recently in a book uh, about boundaries that uh, a, a really good point this author brought forth about the idea of setting boundaries. The book I've mentioned, Good Boundaries, Goodbyes. 
And the author said that, you know, God, he made this statement, God loves his people equally, but he, is, he does not make himself accessible to everyone recently or, or in the same way. And the point of the author was, there's, you know, we need to do the same thing. You know, we love people, but we don't, not everybody has equal access based on a relationship. You know, there's people that folks, they've abused or they will not benefit from having the same access to you as someone that is in a healthy relationship with you. Let me give you an example here. And by the way, real quickly, verse 26 through 29, he's, he's talking about their rebellion. Let me just read this before I share. It says, For among my people are found wicked men. They lay wait as he that set a snares. They, uh, they set a trap. They catch men. These were people that were very, they had no integrity in their dealing with people, other people, fellow Jews. As a cage is full of birds, the idea of a cage is a, like a wicker uh, bird trap that would capture the birds. As a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore they are become great and waxen rich. They were profiting off of uh, injustice and, and not being fair to other people. Verse 28, they are waxen fat. They shine, yea, they overpass the deeds of the wicked. In other words, there's no, no limits or no bounds to what they do. They judge not the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper, and the right of the needy do they not judge. This is what uh, Asaph struggled with in Psalm 73. He saw bad people prospering, and he was doing right and struggling for it. And now, Jeremiah is saying, you, you people are not, you're not acting with integrity with one another. You're not taking responsibility for your actions. And God says in verse 29, Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? It's like, what choice do I have? Some people are so irresponsible that with their own lives that when things began to break down, you know, the New Testament, by the way, the New Testament passage which parallels this could be Galatians um, Galatians 6 and verse 7 it says be not deceived God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap and what it, it, this is the Old Testament version of that Jer Jeremiah is saying um, and God is saying you know they're going to reap what they sowed I, I have to judge them some people are so irresponsible that they assume to have access to other people. They assume that when things start to fall apart in their own life, that other people will come in and rescue them. I, and I want to share this story. Um, we had to learn this the hard way. When I first went into the ministry in Lancaster, uh, we met a dear family. In fact, you may have heard me mention this man. Uh, an older man in his 90s. He played the, the fiddle. Uh, and his profession when he was before he retired was that he was part of the pit orchestra in the silent movies. That's all this guy was. So you're talking um, in the 1980s. He was in his 90s, hadn't worked for a while, but when he did, he played the fiddle for the orchestra for silent movies. And this guy was awesome. He would play Tarantella, if you've ever heard of that. It's a very lively song. And, and in the middle of it, he stops and screams out, Hey! You know, and he just did it so well. And this man was such a... His name was Richard Brash. I love this guy. He is the only one that's ever called me Parson. And he would call me Parson. The Parson's here! You know, and it just... I just... Even when Mary and I were talking about him today, it just... just I love this man. I can't wait to see him in heaven. Uh, and his family, we got involved in his family and just so many precious people. But he had a granddaughter and um, it was his wife's funeral, I think it was. And his wife had taken care of their granddaughter. And um, I remember at the funeral, this, this granddaughter had a mom, but she had already severed ties. Her daughter had been so irresponsible, chosen all the wrong friends, got involved in drugs and just made really bad choices so much so that her mom for her own safety had to pull away set some boundaries and say goodbye at least temporarily uh, tough love her mom would not her mother would not have been wise had she enabled her granddaughter 
And then, and so her, her grandmother, of course, grandparents apparently always step in. So she stepped in and took care of this girl. And now here we were at the grandmother's funeral, and we're all looking at this girl, and the family's like, what's going to happen to her? She doesn't have a place to live. Well, my wife and I, were newly married. We're young and naive. We had all the answers. We're like, we, we will rescue this poor child. We will bring them into our home we will reform this person. We will make them a dynamic Christian because we have the power. And we welcomed her into our home. And from the beginning, we said, now listen, you know, we, 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 want, we want you to experience what we have. We got an awesome relationship. We got this love here. We walk with the Lord. We want you to do this. We want you to succeed. So we're just going to have a couple ground rules. You know, we don't want you being out late at night. Uh, no drugs, sorry, no drugs. And, and these old friends, you got to connect. You know, we just made some sim simple rules. And it became very clear early on. She paid no regard to our rules. And it got to the point where it was affecting our environment because this person had no regard for the things that we did to make a happy home in our environment. And... We realized that, you know, this is kind of probably the first time where, you know what, we cannot allow her to abuse us in this way. And we gave her several warnings, and we eventually had to put our foot down. It was tough, but we had to kick her out. And I, I was asking my wife today because I wanted to make sure I got the story right, because in my memory, she must have been with us for a couple months at least. And my wife, of course, my wife always has a better recognition, recognition than I do. She said, no, she was there for two weeks at most. <laughs> two weeks. I'm like, you're kidding me. It felt like forever. You know, I remember that so well. Now, you know, we, it was hard for me especially. It was hard to kick her out. But for our own sanity and for the environment of our home, we had to do that. Now, some people, and she definitely thought we were mean. She was not looking at, hey, you took me in. When I had nowhere to go, you, you were willing to take me in. Instead of looking at what we were offering for her, you know, this always happens is that we become the bad guys. And that's the way God is. That's the way God is being viewed by Judah. You know, God is setting these parameters and he's like, shall not, I have to judge them. Again, verse 29, shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such nation as this? Now let's get down to the last two verses. So first we saw God's place. He created. Then we saw God's parameters, verses 25 through 29. And now we see God's perplexity. Look at verse 30. A wonderful and horrible thing is committed in the land. Now what a contradictory statement if you look at it in face value. And this is where I remind you, the King James translation was written 400 years ago, and there are some words that have become obsolete. And you and I do would do well to take note of them. This is not a contradiction. The word wonderful has changed over 400 years. And so when, the, when 1604 to 1611, when those translators were writing, the uh, Hebrew word for wonderful had the idea of something spectacular is happening, something that will make you full of wonder it is it is amazing and today the word wonderful is always used in a positive text context wouldn't you say i mean that's no one's ever said of september 11th no one said wow that's wonderful no but if you go back 400 years ago that would have been an appropriate word because what happened on september 11th was it was horrible and, and it was, it was a, another word that we could use, or the proper word, probably as far as a modern English word that would fit the Hebrew word would be astonishing. So we're not talking, wow, this is great. No, we're saying something astonishing has happened and horrible. These two words are going hand in hand. We're talking about something bad and amazing. A wonderful and, or an astonishing and a horrible thing is committed in the land. Verse 31. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. Now that's bad enough right there. The prophets were all false, except for Jeremiah and maybe one or two more. That Some of them we have the record. 
Uh, but by and large, the prophets told Israel what they wanted to hear. We're going to get to see some of them down the road in Jeremiah. And then it says, the priests bear rule by their means. That is, they were in it for filthy lucre. They were doing it for the money. Some people believe that in this statement that the prophets and the priests were actually in collusion together and that the priests kind of bought off the prophets so that the prophets would say good things or whatever the priests wanted and it was kind of this thing. Uh, and that was bad. It was, it was just really bad because they were not seeking to speak properly about God. But that was not the thing that upset the Lord the most. It was not just the prophets prophesy falsely. And it wasn't just that the priests bear rule by their means. They're, they're in it for the money. The thing I think that is the tragic statement is what comes next. And my people love to have it so. It would have been one thing if the priests were corrupt and the prophets were corrupt and the people said, this is horrible, God help us. But the problem was the priests were corrupt, the prophets corrupt, and the people were okay with it. In fact, they liked it that way. It is so sad when we think of what is happening. Jeremiah 6 and verse 15, we're going to get to this. In fact, the very same phrase is, is repeated in Jeremiah 8 and verse 12. Listen to what it says. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall at the time that I visit them. They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. They, these people were doing something that should have been shameful. Folks, when I see what's going on in our country, you know, I was thinking about just the people I knew growing up. I knew how they thought. And we all grew old together. Uh, but when I see where some of these people are, uh, you know, there's a, there's a tide moving in. People are embracing things now that they never would have 20 or 30 years ago because of where the, you know, the, the wind of doctrine, you know, there's this wind coming in and people are embracing things that God calls abomination. And, and things, we could, you know, as the prophets and priests here, we could say these people are doing this, these people are doing this, these people are doing this, all these horrible things. But I'll tell you what breaks God's heart the most is when God's people are apathetic and just say, oh well, and they're, they're okay with it. We need to be righteous. We need to be like the Abraham saying, Lord, I know you're getting ready to judge. Have mercy. We need to be interceders. We need to be people that say, this is not okay. And we are provoking a holy God. And we need to plead with people on behalf of of a holy, righteous God who must punish sin. Let's pray. Father, help us tonight to learn the lesson from Jeremiah. And Father, I pray, I beg you to help us not to fall into the trap that the, the Jews fell into, uh, the um, being enamored with the things of the world and the, the false gods of Canaan. Father, help us to be more concerned about our relationship with you than we are with the status quo or with what's going on around us. Father, help us not to get so upset that we stop walking with you. Father, help us to realize the answer to the problems of our day are literally a closer walk with you and a more zealous attempt to reach souls for Jesus Christ. And so we ask your help. Help us, Father, to be salt and light. Help us to see revival uh, in the church in America. And we just ask your blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, let's stand and we will close in song. Eight one.
blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending bring from above Echoes of mercy, whispers of love This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long On the last Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. You're dismissed.
Domino. 